chosen one. No, I'm the hungry one. The hungry one? What you want to eat, wife? A donut. A donut? <laughs> I was only six years old, but I already wanted more than a donut. I wanted to be normal, to live the American dream. Instead, I got whatever this is. All because my mother wanted to find some place called Utopia. Can I go to bed now? We hit the open road in 1980. Can are we gonna get somewhere? Utopia could be right around the corner, Joshi. Use your third eye and we'll get there faster. We hitchhiked for five years. My mother was looking for a place to call home. Here! This could be our home. Ah! Oh my God! This is our home. And I was looking for a father. Hey! A donut. Sir! Why is he calling you, sir? Because he respects me. It is perfectly good. <coughs> One of these men actually cared about me. Good move, Josh. But my mother chose this guy. He's a freedom fighter. He's going to make an amazing father to you, Joshy. He was the worst decision she ever made. So you go. A man, right? Like me? Right here! Hunter! Don't lie to me! Not, you no, lying no, to no. me! What you going to do, huh? Please, take me with you! Sir, are you his father or legal guardian? No, but I'm sorry. You're gonna have to come with me. Josh! Tell me! Josh! Ah! Uh, you scared? Gun's supposed to protect you. mix of emotion when you haven't been to a place in a long time and the last time I was wandering in this area I was uh, 10, 11. So you know you're kind of like everything is smaller and closer together and um, I want to, uh, first things first tonight I wanted to do a little dedication at the beginning um, as I was meditating on this idea of librarians, um, a public servant that we don't necessarily hear a lot about in the news as far as you know, police and fire and these other things. And I just wanted to um, have in mind tonight a woman named Cynthia Hurd, who was a librarian for the Charleston, South Carolina Public Libraries for 31 years. And you may remember uh, a couple weeks ago, on June 17th, her life was tragically cut short while she was in prayer at the Emanuel AME Church in Charleston. Um, I don't know a lot about Ms. Hurd, uh, but like many of you, I was inspired by her life story and her public service as a librarian and moved by the tragedy of her death. So I want to dedicate my remarks tonight and our conversation this evening uh, to her and hopefully uh, her memory can be a blessing for all of us. So um, with that out of the way, um, I want to talk about, instead of necessarily going over the book, which hopefully many of you will read through our wonderful library right here, or our local bookseller who's in the hall, it's also OK to buy the book. You don't have to check it out. Um, if it's on over 100, once the hold gets over 100, you can buy a copy. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to give a little background about sort of how this book came about. Um, and then the second aspect of it, which may take me a while given the number of wonderful personages in the room, I also wanted to have an opportunity briefly to, to give thanks. Uh, my day job right now is I'm the in-house counsel for the Port of Oakland. We have a seaport, we have an airport. If you've ever flown into Oakland International Airport and gotten into a fight with TSA, I am aware of you. Um, and my airport director always says, you know, how come no one thanks us? There's always like this litany of 
the escalator moved too slow and my son's croc got flushed down the toilet and it's your fault somehow or whatever it is. She said, how come no one ever gives thanks? So I did want to uh, spend a couple minutes tonight giving thanks, although I can already see from this room that I, we might be here all night if I had to do that for everyone who had a positive impact on my life. Um, so the genesis of this book uh, basically begins with my wife, Leah, who got a shout out earlier and I think is hiding there on the corner. <laughs> um, so Leah and I met in Berkeley, California, and for those of you who spent time in Berkeley, um, if you're doing well, you can't show off. You can't like buy a new Mercedes or get a swimming pool installed. That would be totally gauche, totally inappropriate. So you have to have more subtle means of one-upsmanship, and you go over to someone's house, and you know they're using, making you some tea, and you say, oh, I see you guys are still using tea bags. I use a uh, loose leaf herbal oolong that a Burmese tribesman gave me when I was doing a residency as a folk healer there for a couple of years. And uh, you kind of you subtly imply that you're more cultured, more sophisticated. Um, so I met, I met Leah, and um, we went on a date, and she asked me the question that I've always struggled with, like a lot of the children of the counterculture or children of the military or anyone who moved a lot. That weird question, which is, where are you from? And, you know, usually you give like the kind of the varnished expression um, from like Washington State or, you know. But I kind of liked her and I thought, I'm going to give her the straight up answer. So uh, I saw that, you know, the food was taking a while to come. I could have a little uh, breathing room. And I said, well, you know, I was born into a coven of lesbian witches in a Haight Ashbury commune. Um, <laughs> I can tell we're not in the Bay Area, because if we were, a couple people would be like, oh, oh do you know Dave? Because that guy, <laughs> he, grew up, he grew up with the witches. Um, uh, right after the fall of Saigon, um, my birth was a big shock to this group of women, because first of all, the witches had prophesied that I would be born a boy. Uh, I mean, I'd be born a girl, uh, a witchling. But instead, I was born a warlock, which was kind of a challenge to their uh, powers of prophecy. Uh, one of the witches supposedly held me aloft and said, oh no, she's got a penis. Um, so they didn't know what to do with me. It was the beginning of a long uh, career of people not knowing what to do with me. Um, so I, I was born into this, this group of witches and they decided, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll train him up in the, the magic arts for boys. And uh, my mother was also involved in a kind of uh, a variety of anarchist uh, artist groups and other kind of radical organizations. Um, and then Luckily or unluckily, Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980. And my mother, who had grown up with Stalinist parents, uh, whose communist values were too materialistic for her, I'll let you think about that for a second, what that means, um, had come west in the summer of love to overthrow the US government, to reclaim, uh, the, patri to reclaim the goddess, really, from the patriarchy. Um, when Reagan was elected, she realized that nuclear war was imminent. She had to get out of there. We were in a major population center. We had to get onto the road and find this kind of an anarcho-syndicalist commune somewhere beyond the Burger King and the truck stop uh, that would be sort of this utopia that would take us in. And as it turns out, we kind of eventually made it there when I was 12, and a couple of my commune mates are here in the back. But it took us a while to get there, uh, and we spent some time in Stanwood on the way. But... Um, so my mother, we left the city, we began hitchhiking across the American West, and uh, much to not your surprise, my mother didn't find this group of, of you know, conscious, rural, radical anarchists that she was looking for. She kind of found like a bunch of um, a string of, for me, unfortunate male partners that she kind of hitched up with along the way. She had been attracted to women really for uh, political reasons, she told me. Now she's, she was attracted to, to men for chemical reasons. Um, and she, she knew how to pick them. Um, she picked a variety of drifters and grifters and kind of odd new age hucksters. Um, and by the time I was nine, we had hitchhiked for thousands of miles. We had lived on communes, cults, uh, compounds, teepees, tents, trailers buses, vans, and my wife's favorite, uh, ice cream truck. We lived in an ice cream truck for a while. Um, and I had spent, you know, kind of more time dancing around bonfires and meditating in naked sweat lodges than I had in school. Uh, my mother didn't believe in school. She felt that uh, school was no place for kids. That was something that she literally said. 
um, school taught competition and capitalism and violence, all of these awful things, and she was going to teach me herself everything that a growing boy needed to know, whether it was poetry or clairvoyance or how to fashion a tampon out of an organic sea sponge. She was going to teach me. So this was, this was my childhood. Um, and uh, I told all this to Leah, who was duly impressed. Uh, um, she, had been, she had been outclassed. Um, and she knew to, to, get in, to get this kind of sophistication, she would have to marry me. So um, we got married. And she said, you know, you had a really amazingly weird childhood. You have to write this down. And you keep bringing me these pieces of fiction or these kind of long form uh, journalism pieces that you're writing, and they're OK. Um, but you should probably continue filing them in this drawer, because I really want you to write the real story of your childhood. And she pressured me. And I thought about it, and I was like, you know, I, I would do it. Um, but there's a second act to my childhood. And the second act, I don't even want to tell you about it right now, because you might not want to still marry me if I told you about it. I'm, I'm uncomfortable, and uh, I, don't, I don't feel, I don't, I don't want my, uh, uh, my name to be associated with these, with these things that happened to my mother and to me, and, and I'm not ready to talk about it. And Leah very admirably said, okay, fine, I can see this is difficult. We don't have to talk about it, and you don't have to write your book yet. Um, so I graduated from law school. I was 25 years old, and I had this amazing offer. This big corporate law firm was like, hey, we want to pay you all this money. Uh, which was amazing to me because my prior work experience had been in college working as a janitor to get through. I was sort of like the Matt Damon character in Goodwill Hunting, um, except instead of solving the equations, I would like mess with them so no one could solve them. Because um, <laughs> despite Mrs. King's best efforts, I was never a math genius. Um, so um, that, was, that was one job. And the other job I had on my resume was working for, and I'm glad to see it's still standing, for Twin City Foods, um, harvesting peas, driving a, a pod stripper the size of a house that went at one half of a mile per hour. So those were my jobs. My friend Dorothy hooked me up with that job. Thank you. Uh, I may be permanently deaf from the engine. But um, so those are, my, those are my, my jobs, my work experience. This big firm hired me. They bring me in there. They've got this immaculate white carpet. If you spilled something on the carpet, like a guy would run out and bleach it and clean it up. And, I had my own secretary in a corner office, and she first day, she kind of closed the door. She's like, I don't mind. I'm old school. If you want me to do your dry cleaning for you, I'll do your dry cleaning. And I had this moment of panic, because I didn't know what dry cleaning was. <laughs> and, um, and so I, I think I told her, yeah, you know, I like my dry cleaning extra dry. <laughs> and uh, she kind of shot me like a confused look and walked out. Um, so I was feeling good for a kid who'd grown up with a lot of deprivation and you know lived in, in a hot tub for part of the time. I was like, I'm you know I'm part of this big law firm. I'm representing these Fortune 100 companies. I'm really living the American dream, um, and that lasted for about three months. Um, and I guess my roots at that point kicked in, and I was like, you know, I don't I don't really care about what I'm doing. I'm suing this company for this 50 million dollars that neither company really needs, and uh, I'm bored essentially. Um, and at that point, a, a colleague of mine came by and said, hey, um, do you want to help get a battered woman out of prison? And I was not a question you hear every day. And I thought, um, yeah, I want to do that. That sounds good. Uh, let's do that. And California, this was 2002, had just passed a new law, which basically said, hey, we all recognize that women who are in these very abusive relationships uh, sometimes stand up for themselves, sometimes strike back at their batterers. And it's not a cold-blooded, calculated first degree murder. It's something less than that. It's uh, maybe a voluntary manslaughter. Maybe they should be acquitted. But what about all these women who were convicted before California recognized this battered woman's defense? What about all these mothers and grandmothers who are in prison uh, who never got to tell their stories? And I said, OK, yeah, I'll, I'll sign up to, to take one of these cases. So weird thing about representing prisoners is it takes almost as long to get into the prison as it takes to get them out. You gotta, Thumb, you know, fingerprinted and FBI background check, and the FBI was kind of like, you, you like lived in an ice cream truck. It's a little weird. Um, <laughs> but I got in uh, to the prison to, to, to meet my client, and um, she was an uh, older African-American woman. And I walked in, and I was like, OK, 
what happened with your case? Tell me about the abuse. Tell me this. We're going to write down your statement, and we're going to get you out of here. Um, and she was like, hello. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, so I began to, to realize pretty quickly that she wasn't just going to blurt out all of these facts, which I kept trying to tell her, but it's really helpful for you if you tell me what happened so we can get you out of here. And she was like, yeah, that may be so, but I'm having a hard time, you know, uh, being willing to share with you all of my most humiliating, darkest secrets that ever happened to me. And I was like, okay, fair enough. And after a few months, I really felt like I was still getting nowhere. We'd have pleasant conversations about the prison food or unpleasant conversations about what the guards were doing or whatever it was, but she really wasn't disclosing. And finally, I had a, a, a frank conversation with her where I said, look, you know, what's happening? Why aren't you talking to me? And she said, look, it's not that you're white and I'm black, that you're Jewish and I'm Christian. It, it's that you're a man, and the things that happened to me happened at the hands of a man. And it's really hard for me to share with you these very intimate, awful things that happened. And I was sort of stumped. I didn't know what to do at that point. And I said, well, can you tell me something maybe that was funny, as strange as that may sound in this relationship that you were in. She was uh, 15 years old when she was taken by a man who she thought was her boyfriend. Turned out that he was a pimp and a drug dealer, and he abused her pretty ritualistically, pretty awfully, for about six years uh, before friends of her mother's actually killed him. She was, the crime was pinned on her, but it's actually friends of her mother's. So I was trying to get her to talk, and, and, and so I said, what was, what was something that was funny? Uh, and this was what was funny to her. She said, well, you know, when he was done beating me with a bullwhip, he would take a raw steak and put it on the welts on my back to bring down the swelling. And it was funny because he was both beating me and healing me, and because it was dead meat, and yet it was somehow bringing new life to my flesh. Um, and I had, I guess, maybe a flashback, and I broke right through that formal attorney-client relationship. And I said, oh, yeah, I forgot about the raw meat. Um, how do these guys learn about the raw meat? Is there like a school where they teach you? When you're done beating someone, put the raw meat on, and it'll bring the swell. No one will know. You know where does that come from? And she looked at me, and I was like, you know, and, and it was funny for me, too, because we were living in this little place called Stanwood, and uh, we were vegetarians. I couldn't even eat the, the, the meat and the free lunch at school because to do so would have been murder, to kill or eat an animal. But it was somehow okay for my stepfather to beat the heck out of my mother and then put a stake on her face to bring down the swelling on her cheekbone. And I told this to my client. Her name was Deborah. I told this to Deborah, and she gave me this look like, oh, <coughs> Now I see why you're here. You're not here because you're this altruistic lawyer who's trying to do pro bono for the good of the public. You have some personal connection to my story. And I, at the time, had no consciousness of that at all. And sort of she began interviewing me all about, who was this? How did this happen? And I was very impressed. I was like, she's a really good lawyer. She's interviewing me so well, and I'm, she's getting all this information out of me. Um, she later said that she felt like we were a couple of war veterans who are sort of rolling up our sleeves literally and figuratively and comparing our scars and talking through these things. And it's all in the film, Crime After Crime, um, which in full disclosure uh, is streaming on Netflix. So you can, you can get it there. You don't have to buy or rent a copy, um, but you do have to have a Netflix account. Um, it's otherwise available. So um, I'm, I'm still representing her. There's now a film being made about it. She was convicted of murder more than 20 years ago, but tonight attorneys fighting for a battered woman's freedom say there's a lot we haven't heard about her story of abuse and desperation. Debbie Piegler was 15 when she first met Oliver Wilson. He came across as charismatic and quite charming. I got him. Hmm, he's kind of cute. <laughs> Oliver was a hustler. You can pimp your mama, you can pimp your sister, you can pimp your daughter. You can't have no sympathy towards well, anybody. He was just kicking me and kicking me and kicking me. And I was like, okay, okay, I promise, I promise, I'll do it, I promise, I'll do it next time, I promise, I promise, just don't, please don't hit me no more, please don't hit me no more. Debbie's mother suggested to Debbie that she let Ramon Sibley and little Timmy Lively make Oliver leave her alone. But I didn't want nobody to kid him, but I wanted somebody to beat the hell out of him. And she told me her story, and I was able to use that story 
to work to get her out, and ultimately her case went on and on for seven and a half years, and it became this big precedential. And uh, my wife is bringing up this idea of the book again, and this moment comes when I, this, this film that's gonna go to Sundance, Oprah Winfrey, they wanna interview me about that experience, because they know, come on, what motivated you to take this case, you know? And it was wearing a little thin, like, well, I just like to do good for people in prison every once in a while, you know? And they were sort of like, what's, what's motivating you? And I was really having a hard time telling my story. And at this point, I'm no longer sort of this, this kid who's not in control of things. I'm this lawyer, and I have a reputation. Oh. And, I'm uh, and I really had a long night kind of thinking, am I going to do this interview? And I talked to Deborah, who basically gave me the kick in the pants that I needed. And she said, look, a lot of people think that this kind of thing can happen to a poor black woman from South Central LA, like me, and it happened to me. But who would have thought that it could happen to someone like your mother? Your mother was the least likely victim of domestic violence, the least likely, no one could believe it. And if it could happen to your mother, it could happen to anyone. Um, so that was, that was Deborah's challenge to me, and I, that motivated me to go ahead and write this book. Um, and that second phase, that second act of my childhood, was this absolutely stunning transformation where my mother, who had brought me up and taught me not to call her mom, not to call her mother, because that would have limited her, that would have been sexist to pigeonhole her into the role of a mother. She was a full human being with all that that entailed. Her name was Claudia. I was to call her Claudia, so I called her Claudia. Um, this was a woman who felt that the word woman should be spelled with Y's because a woman was more than a man with a womb appended to it. Um, she told me about her story, not history. Why should it be his story? It should be her story. So my mother was a true radical feminist. She actually, in interviewing her, it was fascinating, actually belonged to a women's secessionist group who actually wanted to secede from America and have a woman's republic. And once they figured out the whole reproduction thing, it was going to be amazing. Um, but they never, they, um, they never did figure that out. But um, I'm sure when they do, my mom will be back there. But. Um, so th this was the woman who, who was raising me. And, uh, and then in my, in my own mind, I was like, wait, and then you married like this violent alcoholic? Like, what's wrong with you? Um, and in interviewing my mother, I realized that I was carrying a lot of the baggage about domestic violence, a lot of the mythology that most people kind of carry, um, which is, of course, the stunning realization that women don't marry violent alcoholics. They don't go down to the bar, which used to be Bob's Grocery over here. I don't know what it is. But, <laughs> They don't go down to the bar and say, you know, I'm single, I'm made up. Is there anyone here who's got a severe drinking problem and an anger management problem? Because we should get together, you know. It doesn't happen that way. Um, so as, as my mother was, was uh, kind of explaining it to me, I was beginning to see things through her, through her eyes, which is we were living up in a little mountain on top of, uh, above Clear Lake, which you guys actually might know where that is in Skagit County. And my mother was very involved in sanctuary work. Um, and in fact, um, her friend Tammy Kirby, whose daughter is here, was involved in that work too, of helping, and others may have been, in helping Central American refugees, who are essentially the victims of US foreign policy in Central America, um, get asylum. Uh, because they were coming to the United States and their families had been tortured and all kinds of, of awful things. And my mother, in that capacity, met a man who was 10 years her junior, very swashbuckling, ripped, as we would say, with a red headband and wild Che Guevara hair. And he was a poet and a shaman and a healer. And uh, he began uh, meeting with my mother and taught her how to dance and taught her how to cook. My mother, as part of her feminist belief system, literally believed that women should not learn how to cook because that was giving in to a stereotype. So. Um, Leia's always been a very impressive cook, but I can never tell whether that's because I ate a lot of canned food or because she's amazing. So I'm sure it's because you're amazing. Um, so my mother, you know, did, he was teaching how to cook and these Central American dishes, and he began to tell her things. And my mother had thought of, uh, thought of herself as sort of the frizzy-haired Jewish girl with big glasses who no one wanted to ask to the dance. And here was this man, this, this uh, apex of manhood, who was saying things to her like, Sometimes I think the reason that my family was massacred, the reason that I was tortured by the death squads was so that I could meet you, Melinda, the most beautiful woman in the world. I love you so much. You know, my mother was taken in by this. And of course, it was natural that my soon-to-be stepfather named Leopoldo, that um, 
he began to, to drink alcohol in excess, which my mother explained as he was self-medicating because of all the demons of his past. And he would wake up in the middle of the night, sometimes strangling my mother or slapping her, again, as part of his PTSD. And my mother was determined that we were going to help, we were going to help heal this man. And one of the things that Leopoldo used to like to do when he wasn't uh, beating on my mother at this point was picking fights with police officers, um, which do not try at home, not a good thing to do. But this was one of his activities, and I think in part because he liked to pick fights with a lot of guys, but they were only guys who were smaller than he was because he had to make sure that he was going to win. And when you pick a fight with a cop, they typically just arrest you instead of fighting you. So he could always say afterwards, like, I would have win, I would have won had he not arrested me. And you're like, yes. You would have won for sure, you know. Um, <clears throat> so one night, um, he doesn't come home. We realize he's in jail. <clears throat> we have my grandma Harriet wire some money to bail him out. We get him out, and he comes to us with the bad news, which is that they're going to deport him. And in El Salvador, there's a list of the most wanted fugitives taped up on a wall somewhere, and his name is at the top of the list. So the second his foot hits that tarmac basket back at uh, Cuscatlan Airport in San Salvador, he'll be shot through the back of the head and bleed out on the airport. So for him, uh, deportation is a death sentence. So how else can my mother save this man but by marrying him, to keep him in the country? And my mother, who had thought of marriage as women being sold as chattel, is now enthusiastically going in to, to marry him. For those of you who have some basic understanding of the biblical narrative, you realize how ironic it is that his religion of choice for the wedding is the occult magic of ancient Egypt. We're having like a pyramid-themed wedding. We've got pharaonic headdresses on. Uh, and the night before the wedding, he gets into the box of wine and really beats my mother uh, with closed fists in front of me. It's the first time that it's just been, uh, I didn't know if she was going to live or not live. And the next morning, through kind of cracked lips and swollen fingers, she's postponing the wedding, not canceling it, because she's unpresentable as is. And 10 days later, this woman who uh, objected to cosmetics because it was sexist for a woman to modify her appearance to please a man, my mother is in full, massive makeup, even more than 1980s Stanwood High makeup, just tons of makeup. Um, and uh, she's got a black eye and a swollen cheek underneath all that. And they're married in this kind of farcical ancient Egyptian occult wedding. And by the time my mother realizes that more than being a shaman or a healer or a hero of the revolution, this guy's basically just a violent alcoholic, we are in the same awful bind that many women and children find themselves in, which is we have no money except through him. My mother was on welfare. She gave up that welfare to marry him, and now we're dependent on him. Um, socially, we don't know anyone that he hasn't approved of. He's so hyper jealous that when we went to the thrifty foods here and my mother took too long, he was sure that she was having an affair with like the box boy in the back or something. Um, and for us, we were geographically isolated. We had started out above Clear Lake and the landowner came and said, well, I'm going to clear cut this whole area, including your worthless cabin. You got to move. Uh, we were friends with a guy named Crazy John at the time who, as his name would indicate, had some mental health issues. And um, Crazy John told us that his family had some land out on one of the islands, which I was excited. Like, the islands, I'm imagining, like, steel drum and margaritas, and um, the island was Camano Island. Um, so we're now kind of camped on the forest floor on Camano Island, uh, sleeping above the mud in some wooden crates that my mother and stepfather have salvaged from behind that very same Thrifty Foods. And we're sleeping there, and uh, it's starting to rain, and my stepfather is appropriately enough, of course, building us a pyramid to channel the blue healing energy of ancient Egypt. But the rains are coming, and he's working with uh, no power tools at all to make this pyramid. And I decide, perhaps, just maybe, school is a place for kids. Maybe that's a place <laughs> that I should go check out. Um, so I walk out, emerge from this sort of wall of forest on Camano. There's a bus. And I get to the bus, and I'm covered in pine sap and cedar sprays. I've got, like, spiders crawling on me, wearing raggedy old thrift store clothing from the Salvation Army in Mount Vernon that my mother has kindly patched with blue paisley patches. <laughs> and I get to the bus, and you can imagine the reception I received from the kids who were, uh, in a way, enthusiastic to see me in a very bad way. 
Um, and I get on the bus and it's like a gauntlet getting through and it's just awful. And I get to school and I get to Mrs. King's classroom at the school. And I think pretty quickly the teachers realize, well, this guy on the one hand is kind of smart, but on the other hand doesn't really understand the conventions of a classroom. You gotta like raise your hand to be called upon that you can't uh, refer to Reagan as being a racist demon. Um, <laughs> you, uh, you can't criticize the social studies teacher for being a sexist, it's, just, it's not appropriate. Um, and more than anything, Mrs. King it, it diagnosed me and said, look, you, know, you can't read or write in cursive or longhand, which my daughters now tell me is irrelevant. But at the time, that was a big deal. Um, and I basically couldn't do math. And my mother had never, you know, thought that it was important. So she has me, you know, do this problem. She's giving me 10 times 10. And I'm like, zero times zero, zero, you know, trying to do 10 times 10. Can't do it. Um, and so she says to me, do uh, you want to stand up for a second? I know you have a daughter or granddaughter, but I just feel you get the, thank you. So. I recognize you. I don't know. Yeah, so that was my, maybe not, but you, but you go by Rose, 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 Rose King. So um, Mrs. King was my sixth grade homeroom teacher. I don't know if you remember, I had less facial hair. I was like <laughs> 900 pounds smaller. Um, so she gets in it, and I remember this conversation, and she says, look, you know, I'll work with you. I'll stay after school with you and tutor you because I can see that you're smart. You're behind grade level, but you don't need to go into these remedial classes that they want to put you in. I can, I can work with you, and if you'll work with me, I'll work with you. And it was sort of this awkward thing where I was like, whoa, but I have to get back on the bus to go back over the bridge to get to Camano. And she said, well, you know, your mom can pick you up late. And I was sort of like, well, like the car, my stepfather crashed the car. <laughs> and then she said, uh, well, let's, let's call your mom. We'll go to the office. We'll call your mom. We'll figure it out. And I was like, well, we don't have a phone. <laughs> Running water, electricity, address, house. So I, I think you were, I don't know, you were just kind of like, OK, let's figure out how this is going to work. Um, and so, and, but it really touched me. That was a moment that it was, it was the first time, it was my first experience in, in, in a real school, but also my first, the first time that someone who had no business caring about me was like, I'll stay after. And even then, as a sixth grader, I was like, I'm pretty sure she's not going to get paid for that. That's like an extra thing <laughs> that she's going to do, and that's so sweet of her. So I was really that really touched me. Um, and luckily for me, or uh, luckily for me, my stepfather then Leopoldo he then uh, gets drunk one night and takes out a knife and threatens to kill Crazy John and his then pregnant girlfriend. Which at that point I realized, you know, Crazy John isn't so crazy anymore. We're the we're the crazy ones. Um, and we end up getting a little house, and, and so Crazy John says, I'm going to call the cops. He's sane enough to know that he can threaten that and that that will scare my stepfather. So we end up moving a few blocks from here in that direction into this little uh, house in like a fourplex with these three kind of migrant families who are struggling to get by, and we're living in this funky little apartment. And I go to Mrs. King and I say, guess what? I can, I can get some of that free tutoring you were offering now. That would be great. Um, so she said, great. And she brought me up to grade level. I don't know how many hours it took. I don't remember exactly how far behind I was. But she tutored me. And the next thing, I, she was teaching me literally how to read and write in longhand and um, really turned my life around. So thank you right there. That's one solid thank you. Um, Hi, I'm Rose King, retired teacher from Stanwood, uh, taught at Stanwood Middle School, sixth grade. And so it's, a, it's always a big change from elementary school when they come into middle school. Most of them come in a little scared. Josh came in knowing so much about the world, so much about philosophy that you knew right away this was an exceptional student. Uh, he was just missing some of his basics uh, penmanship, um, multiplication facts, uh, spelling. So w right away I knew this kid was going to go far. Uh, I needed, he ne needed to brush up on some of the basics and so I offered to have him stay after school and unfortunately couldn't at first but they moved into town. I, I, Josh came in, 
he was not an ordinary student. He didn't wear the clothes that were popular in the 80s. He was kind of a little nerdy looking guy, uh, wearing his little sweater and pants that weren't quite fitting right. Uh, but he, uh, he was just exceptional. I just, I just loved him. I, 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 I did what most teachers do. You give and you give because that's what teachers do. I don't think I, I, I don't feel any exceptional thing about that because he was willing to work. Um, I, I remember when he was working so hard on his multiplication and finally he figured out he just had to multiply, you just had to memorize these multiplication facts, because he was adding 8 plus 8 plus 8 plus 8. It was taking him a long time to do his math. And I said, Josh, you're smart. All you have to do is, is memorize 8 times 4 is 32. And you know, it was just the light bulb came on. It was one of those light bulb moments that um, he, you just, all of a sudden, he realized how easy it was for him. I was so thrilled when Stacy from the library called and said, told me about this book. So of course I went on the website and looked it up and bought the book on Amazon right away. And uh, I, I'm just thrilled that he has made so much out of his life. And it's an example of what can, you can do with your life even when life throws you some hard balls and soft balls because he didn't have what we would call our normal child and upbringing, but he made it and I'm so proud of him. Um, so that was, a, that was a big moment for me, so I was starting to sort of step into, step into the modern world. And um, then the other aspect that, that was really exciting for me is we were now walking distance to the library. So I want to...